Welcome. I'm Michael Baker. Thanks for joining me today as we explore concepts with the objective of improving your management skills and growing your business. Pause the video right now so that you can grab a notepad and a pen because I want you to make a commitment that you will jot down something, take away something today that you can implement in your business today, an action item. Remember, everything is about implementation. Those businesses that implement their best ideas and are actually involved in action, moving their businesses forward, will outperform the competition. Today, I wanna to talk to you about some sales techniques that have psychological underpinnings and are very effective because they take advantage of how we naturally behave psychologically as human beings. So let's just go through a few and then what I'd like you to do is contemplate as we go through them and later, are you taking advantage of this in your sales process? Are you taking advantage of this when you communicate your marketing messages to your customers? And if you're not, you can rest assured some of your competitors are and they may have a leg up on you. Now, we want to be transparent and I don't want you to think of something as um, being disingenuous or sort of scammy just because it takes advantage of a psychological phenomenon. In fact, when you consider relationships with everyone in your life, we often be, uh, we take advantage of the, the psychological behavior and patterns that we know about so that we can be more persuasive. I mean, just being something as, uh, uh, you know, being something like courteous to somebody in your communication style, you inherently understand, you naturally get that that's going to uh, provide better results in terms of your communication with somebody and you'll be more effective. And so, you know, you, you can win more, bees with honey than vinegar, what is the expression, or more flies with honey than vinegar. And so don't think that you are being manipulative in a negative way when you take advantage of how people psychologically respond to situations. In fact, I would argue that it's your obligation to try to use what you know in terms of human behavior to try to communicate more effectively your marketing messages. So with that in mind, let's, let's explore a few of these. And you may be familiar with some of these terms or some may be new to you, but as always, you should go and ask yourself and do a sort of an introspection, an analysis of your business and determine whether or not you're taking advantage of what you already know or what you're learning. So the first one is known as anchoring. Anchoring is a psychological phenomenon in which we tend to rely too heavily on the first piece of data that we get. And in terms of sales, this is often um, utilized in pricing stra uh, strategies. So if you see a price, if you think of the proverbial 1-800 infomercials of days gone by, I don't know that there's many that still exist, but probably they do. And there was, you know, you won't pay $1.99 for this product. And you can imagine that eventually by the end of the commercial, it was going to be $19.99. But it was, and you won't pay $200. You won't pay $100. You won't even pay $50. But what they're doing by bringing up those data points early is they're anchoring your brain. They're anchoring you to a price point. And when the psychology or when the scientists were doing this, they um, presented sort of random um, estimates to people. What they would do is they would give them a figure. I'll give you an example that I heard. So would you guess that Mount Everest, which is the highest point on earth, uh, highest elevation, would you guess that that is higher or lower than 60,000 feet? So what I've done is I've anchored you with 60,000 feet. Now, maybe just pause the video and reflect for just a second or just automatically respond. Is Mount Everest higher, the peak of Mount Everest, higher or lower than 60,000 feet? And so you have a guess. If we were to anchor a different group by me asking that same question and saying, would you guess that Mount Everest is higher or lower than 10,000 feet? What we would see psychologically in the experiment is that the average elevation guessed by those in the first group, if we assume 
for the sake of argument that people don't know what the elevation is. And actually, I don't know off the top of my head, but I have an idea. Um, those who were anchored with the 60,000 um, elevation in the question would on average guess higher than those who are anchored with the 10,000. So I believe that Mount Everest is maybe just under 30,000. It's in that 25 to 30,000 foot uh, elevation, I believe. You'll have to look it up and, and check me on that. So um, I'm not sure what your guess was, but if, if somebody had guessed to the second question, um, or the, the same question with the anchor of 10,000, it would have on average been lower. And so that describes anchoring, that's an example, that's sort of the um, observation that psychologists made when they were determining this. And that's how it's used in marketing, in pricing, is that you anchor people with a higher price. So you might, you might plant a message that um, this, um, compare at, or you see on sometimes price tags, they'll say that compare at $89.99 and then it's actual price is 40 or on sale and it's strike through. And there are laws governing that uh, when you state something's on sale that it must have been sold at some point or another in the past at the actual retail price. But that's the same thing when somebody says manufacturer suggested retail price of fifty thousand dollars and then they're showing you a sale price or an actual price or a retail price of forty eight thousand they're anchoring you so that it creates more value so what you want to do if you're going to use this in a uh, pricing strategy is present numbers to your customers that anchor them higher than what the price that you're going to charge is that's i guess obvious and again, if and what I would like you to do in each of these examples and these psychological uh, techniques is ask yourself in your sales price, uh, sorry, in your sales process, in the context of your business, whether that is face to face sales or virtual in a passive sales environment, online, e commerce, that kind of thing, where does it make sense to do it? And of course, you can do it both ways because most businesses uh, today who do engage still in a face to face sales. Um, presentation and sales journey, sales funnel, they also have uh, e-commerce or at least a virtual um, presentation that they do as well. And so I think of businesses that offer software as a service, you'll often see that they have um, various packages. So there is the basic package and there is the um, basic plus package, there's the pro package and the enterprise package, all increasing in pricing. But if we were using the anchoring sales strategy or rather pricing strategy, psychological phenomenon, then you would argue you should put the highest priced item first. You wouldn't want to start with the basic on the left side of the screen and have people work their way up mentally. So, and yet many companies do. So if you, if you really fully believed in the anchoring sales uh, or pricing strategy and the psychology behind it, you may want to consider putting your highest price stuff first and, and making sure that that's the number that anchors the customer. And then when they see some of your lower priced options or, um, or they see a lower price on the same option, they, it'll automatically psychologically appear to be a greater value. Another one is known as framing. So framing is all about how you present the information to the customer in terms of is it positive or negative. The actual data, the actual information that you're communicating doesn't change one way or the other, but it's how you frame it. And so if you consider two competing products that, had, that were identical in nature and they had the same benefit, and then what you would do to try and beat your, your competitor is you would frame it in such a way that appeals to people. And so what we've seen in the grocery store a lot, when there was that whole low fad eating fad that started, um, uh, I don't know, in the 80s through the 90s, there was lots of low fad, sorry, low fat fad. And uh, it was like 95% fat free. Instead of saying 5% fat, it was 95% fat free. So that's about framing it 
in the context of making it positive. If somebody thinks of something as being fat free as a positive, then you want to frame it that it is 95% positive, 95% fat free. Of course, I don't subscribe to that and hopefully you don't subscribe to that um, uh, fat paradigm anymore. Good healthy fats are very uh, nourishing to you and eating very low fat would be probably detrimental to your health. But that's a side issue. We can get into that another time. The other one would be, let's say you were considering buying something that was uh, disinfected that you were going to clean with. And one was marketed as kills 99.9% .9 of germs. And you could frame that as actually um, only 0.1% of germs survive. And you might say, well, nobody wants to um, want to hear about that. And, and that sort of speaks to what we're talking about. Psychologically, it's intuitive that you're like, well, that would be framing it negatively. Nobody wants to focus on how many germs survive. They want to focus on how many it kills. That's what framing is all about. So ask yourself in your business, what is it that you would like to present to your customers? And, you know, like, 95% of your customers re, um, report that they are extremely satisfied. That's uh, framing things as opposed to 5% of your cu customers report that they're not extremely satisfied. Think about how in your marketing messages, in your sales messages, you can frame things in the context that puts it in a positive light. Is there anything that you're framing um, that puts things in a negative light and ask, you know, do focus groups, ask people to consider, look through all of your marketing messages and make sure you're framing things positively. Another one is known as the law of reciprocity. And this is pretty simple and very intuitive as well. But the question is, are you taking advantage of this? Are you utilizing this in your business, in your um, sales process, in your techniques, in your marketing messages. So the law of reciprocity is simply about this psychological thing where it's sort of a tit for tat. It's where we feel obligated to give to someone who's giving something to us. It's sort of considered um, fair and what's right to do. Have you ever had somebody give you a Christmas gift or a birthday present? And that is somebody that you had not purchased something for on their birthday or on Christmas. Right away, you sort of feel guilty inside and you start to think, oh, I guess I, I should maybe get them something. Uh, I should get her something. The uh, law of reciprocity is all about the psychology behind that. And so in your business, how can you do that? In terms of virtual um, and more passive marketing, strategies. I think content marketing has its basis in this psychology. Content marketing is where you are creating content that is often free or very low cost to the consumers of that content, such as this video, such as blog posts, maybe an ebook, these kinds of things. And you offer those to your um, clients. And of course, one of the thing or your, or your leads, your prospective clients, one of the things you're hoping for is that it generates interest and it maybe uh, demonstrates the expertise and it maybe builds value in the services you offer. But also it's giving them something at no cost. And that psychological underpinning that foundation that we all have, in which you kind of feel obligated to give back to people who are giving to you. That is something that's very powerful. And I've seen that in uh, uh, brick and mortar sales processes. I was sitting down one time while somebody I was with was trying on clothing at a very high end boutique. And they gave me, they viewed me as one of the decision makers and they gave me uh, a beverage to drink. Very nice cool, refreshing beverage with uh, a garnish of some kind. And that's about the law of reciprocity. They're building a feeling of obligation because of the hospitality they're showing me. I then may feel more obligated back to them. Or there was this concept in the sales process I was engaged in for many years known as an exit gift. And when customers were leaving the showroom, we would present them with a gift 
on their way out. And it wasn't an expensive gift. It was only about a $2 gift, but it was a powerful way of making them feel obligated. And in that instance, what we were hoping to get, the reciprocal exchange we were hoping for is the willingness to follow up with them or for them to allow us to follow up with them. So they would give us contact information. And when compared with another sales experience in which they didn't receive anything at another showroom, then ours would be more positive. They would feel more obligated to us than, than the competitor. And so we also in sales processes have given away um, little folders filled with information that help the customer make a decision. And in um, nowadays, instead of giving a bunch of printed materials and paper, you might um, send your customer a bunch of content and in his inbox, he has several attachments that help him with his research. Well, that's good service. And in exchange for that good service, there's likely a feeling of obligation, that law of reciprocity, that psychological experience kicks in. Ask yourself in the context of your business, what are you doing to take advantage of the law of reciprocity? Is there something that you can offer your customers of value that's physical, tangible, or is there something more digital that you can offer in the, the virtual sales process? How are you doing this on your website? How are you doing this in your marketing? How are you doing this face-to-face -face with your customer in the delivery? We also have what we call delivery gifts. Maybe you're giving a little bit of a bonus to people, something above and beyond what they expected, what they paid for. You're giving a little free sample or a little extra something. And that um, th that's a sort of a, a technique designed to wow them, to exceed their expectations, but it also takes advantage of that law of reciprocity. Next, I'd like you to consider the concept of using analogies in your communication. And an analogy is a very powerful way uh, to take advantage of the psychology of somebody because it gives them a frame of reference, something that they're more familiar with, something that they've already accepted, or like I said, are familiar with, and you're introducing a newer concept to them and you're making it more familiar by the analogy, by the description of the analogy. And this is often, most often used in terms of pricing. So this may sound familiar to you when I give you an actual example in a word track. So let's say you were selling something that is maybe between $1,500 and $2,000 for, um, and it, it's, for a year, maybe it's something that's gonna last a year or whatever. So you might say, for about the price of a coffee per day, you can own this. $1,500 per year works out to about $4.11 per day. And so there are people who are certainly spending that on coffee per day. Another one might be like, uh, for the price of a pizza, per, for the price of your weekend pizza, so maybe, you know, pizza varies in price depending on if you buy the cheapest stuff or a more gourmet pizza, higher end pizza. But at $25, and, and if you were inferring that a person on approximately once per week is buying a pizza, you could uh, suggest that for a $200 per month commitment, it's about the price of a pizza per month. And when you say about, that, that gives you a little bit of a range as well. And of course, $200 per month is now $2,400 per year. And so you can use these analogies to help sort of soften the blow of what somebody is considering investing in your product or service, especially if it's a new, um, new thing to their lifestyle or to them, you know, it's new money, it's something new that they're spending. And so if they think to themselves, oh yeah, I guess, you know, 25 bucks a week, that's not that big a deal. Maybe, you know, how much are you spending on Netflix per month? Is it uh, $12.99 per month, $15.99 per month for a streaming service, $9.99 per month? And you could easily come up with an analogy if you were trying to share that with somebody and make them justify psychologically that that's easy uh, to afford. Another thing that I've seen used very effectively in sales is loss aversion or scarcity. Where you see that online is where you're considering, maybe you're on a, the details page of a particular product and you see how few are left in inventory, only three remaining. 
and we'll see that on big sites like Amazon and others. That's taking advantage of the psychological nature we have, the fear of loss, the fear of missing out or FOMO. So consider that. You have, like most businesses, limited inventory, uh, limited capacities, I presume, to be able to offer your products and services. Are you communicating that to your customer in such a way that they may um, pull the trigger and create a little bit more urgency, take advantage of that psychology where people don't want to miss out by sharing with them that there is a limit to how much you can provide. Have you, can you think of yourself when you've been purchasing something and as soon as you ascertained that it is scarce in some way, it helped you make your decision much faster. You pulled the trigger. It's very frustrating to do a bunch of research and then finally make a decision on something and then find out, oh, I'm sorry, we sold out of that and uh, you can't get it for, um, you know, it's on back order now for a couple of weeks or whatever. So again, you're doing a customer a service to let them know about these things. The question is, are you taking advantage of that by making sure, or are you afraid that it comes across as manipulative or too much like uh, a greasy sales technique? In fact, it's doing your customer a, a valid service. It's just giving them more information and it takes advantage of the psychology where nobody wants to miss out. Now, a person can still decide, that's fine, I will take the risk. I know there's only two left. I'll take the risk, I wanna think on it overnight or whatever. And if, if you've provided the information, then it, it may have influenced one person to buy, it may have not influenced another, but later you don't have to worry that the person is now frustrated. They can at least take a little bit of responsibility that they had the information there. So fear of missing out, scarcity, a loss aversion, these are very powerful things. There's another thing related to that known as the takeaway close, and that is where there, you're in some kind of negotiation and then you essentially you change your mind. You say, you know what, the deal is it's, it's pushed too far. I think we should just call it. Thank you very much for your interest. It's no longer on the table. And of course, how that is presented depends on your industry and, and what you're selling. But taking the, your last offer or the entire offer off the table for the person you're negotiating with can be a powerful way to take advantage of that psychology of fear of missing out. And they, that's known as the takeaway close. You take it away as an option, all of a sudden the person has to have it. And in relationships, there is uh, there are theories that, you know, you know, don't know what you've got till it's gone. And uh, people in relationships often miss the person that they were once with when they can no longer be with him or her. And uh, the idea that you might lose something is very powerful. So loss aversion, takeaway clothes, scarcity, those types of things. You don't want to create this um, idea in your customer's mind that there's so much abundance of product that it doesn't matter. Whenever they want, they can have it. Now that, that can be very powerful if um, your competitors are always selling out or something like that, then you can you know market the fact that you have lots to choose from and selection is excellent and that kind of thing just be careful that uh, you have a balance there because the psychology of fear of missing out loss aversion those things are very um, psychologically powerful next there's this concept of bandwagon selling or bandwagon marketing and that's real simple and you've all experienced this as well and that is sort of the everyone's doing it concept. It's okay, you should buy this, you should consume this product because everyone is. You know, nine out of 10 so-and-sos recommend this, uh, over 30 billion served, these types of things where you're presenting in your communication, in your marketing message, in your sales channel, you're presenting the customer with information, leading them to the understanding that this is very popular and the psychology, uh, the underlying psychology would have something to do with people um, 
taking comfort in the numbers and that other people would have done the research. And if everyone's doing it, it can't be wrong. If everyone's buying that, it must be good. There must be value there. Of course, that's not necessarily true, but in your case, for your business, you must have a very good product or service. And how are you taking advantage of bandwagon selling and the psychology behind it? Make sure that you communicate with your customers and um, the psychology, remember, what is the number one thing that prevents people from buying? It's fear of making a mistake. People are risk averse. So make sure that you're using bandwagon selling or something similar to communicate that others have made that decision and, and uh, are very happy with the decision. And that lots of people are making the same decision they're considering and have been very satisfied. So sharing customer testimonials, ratings, and reviews are a pow powerful way of doing that. The last one I wanted to talk about is the idea of naming your product or branding it. You may offer something that is somewhat generic. So perhaps you offer a, a type of service. You have a trade that you're offering and you can offer that as simply the generic term for your industry, which may be plumbing or it may be uh, construction of some kind and uh, uh, or electrician. I'm struggling to think of examples right now, but think about your own business. Do you offer just the generic name for your product or have you branded it and named it something powerful? There have been psychological studies that have shown that there is a strong correlation between products that are named and how much more value people place on them. So there's a bottle of red wine and then there's a particular type of red wine that has a, a, a name brand. Now, it's very obvious to you that there is very powerful branding out there. So Apple, very strong brand, Coca-Cola, very strong brand. Of, I mean, there's, there's generic colas that not many people are buying in the grocery store right beside Coca-Cola or beside Pepsi but it's the brand that adds more value, even though the ingredients may be very close to identical and the experience that you have may be very close. And so you're, you, I don't think have any problem accepting the premise of a brand being very powerful. That's not exactly, that is taking advantage of the same psychological phenomenon that I'm describing, but at a base level, it works for just having a name versus a generic um, marketing message. So even if you don't have a very strong, powerful, well-known brand, you should still consider applying a name to the products and services that you're offering. So let's use the example of plumbing. So maybe you are offering a plumbing service. Could you call it the, um, the gold package or... I'm, <laughs> I didn't come up with an example prior to recording the video, but you get the idea on your website, in your marketing messages, when you're speaking with customers, apply the brand name to it. And it might be your company's name, but I would say the product or service within your company, you should apply names to. Don't just strictly go with your company name if you offer multiple products or services from your company. So branding and naming is a way to increase value as well. There's a myriad of different pricing strategies that psychologists have looked at and seen what works and what doesn't work and you should continue to research these. I'm going to leave it with those ones for now and I wonder if you'll do some homework today, look at your overall marketing message, your sales channel and ask yourself, are you taking advantage of those psychological tendencies that people have and the power of communicating with those in mind when you are doing your marketing. So I'm gonna leave it with that, or leave you with that today. Please make sure you commit to doing something in your business, drive it forward today. Leave a comment about whether you agree with some of the comments that were made. Do you disagree with this? Are there some other psychological phenomena that occur out there that you're familiar with that we didn't discuss, that we should discuss? Let's learn from one another perpetual refinement.